สวัสดีครับ I'm very honored uh, and pl- privileged to be here. This is my first time in Thailand, and I had a, uh, a great experience touring around a little bit the other day with Ramez and seeing some of your uh, ancient lessons of, of health and medicine. And uh, you know what's interesting uh, about today and what you've been learning here uh, through the summit is that there are many technologies that are accelerating, sometimes exponentially, just sometimes rapidly, that we can apply. To the today and the near future of health and medicine, and of course, healthcare is a broad spectrum from keeping ourselves, our friends, our family, our employees healthy and happy, prevention, wellness, the future of diagnostics, picking up disease early rather than late, its therapy being more personalized and more precise and less toxic, its globalizing health, democratizing it so we can reach everywhere from rural Thailand to rural Africa. And it's also about discovery, how we can all play a role, whether you're in healthcare or health tech or biotech or any other field, in accelerating new discoveries and crowdsourcing the future of medicine. And of course, you know, here in well, in the U.S. and in Thailand, we have many major diseases, and many of them, from diabetes and hypertension and to stroke and cancer, are partially preventable if we can start to change our behaviors, particularly from the early forms of life. Um, and you have amazing, you have a pretty good public healthcare system, and some amazing private healthcare. I think part of the opportunity with technology is to bridge the gap um, between the sort of more basic and super advanced forms, and to really accelerate healthcare for everyone, particularly as you move into this world of of healthcare 4.0. Now, of course, as was just mentioned, Thailand is the number one destination for healthcare tourism. So, using some of these emerging and new technologies can keep you number one and hopefully expand your market and bring better care uh, in Southeast Asia and beyond. So, before we go, you know, into the future, sometimes it's useful to say, you know, where are we really today? Um, I went to medical school at Stanford. I did my medical training at Harvard and Massachusetts General Hospital. I recently went back to visit Mass General Hospital for its 200th anniversary. Um, back in the day, there we were when we were young interns and doctors. And I went back to visit the ward, the, 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 the part of the hospital where I was, a brand new doctor. And to my shock and a bit to my dismay, it was pretty much unchanged in almost 20 years. Some of the same nurses, maybe some of the same patients. Um, The only the only difference was the doctor was typing the medical record. We used to handwrite the record, and the front desk was still using the cutting edge medical communication tool of the day, today, the fax machine. And I'm sure some of you are still using fax machines. So my thought was, even in amazing hospitals, from Bangkok Hospital to Mass General to Stanford, we're still practicing health and medicine in old-fashioned ways, waiting in the waiting room for an hour, whether you're in San Francisco or Calcutta or here in Bangkok. Sort of the models of, of health have, have been broken down into old silos and old ways of thinking. And so the opportunity for all of us is to rethink and reimagine healthcare outside of these silos in this exponential, digital, connected age, and, and not think about medicine by by body parts and subspecialties. But connect the dots in new forms. Part of that new thinking is to move from a world of sick care to health care. What do I mean by sick care? Well, here in Thailand and everywhere else around the world, we practice sick care. We get very little bits of data from ourselves, from our patients. Every, you know, you might visit the doctor once a year or after you're sick. You might get your corporate EKG. If you have high blood pressure or diabetes, maybe you're sending by fax machine the information to your doctor, whether they want to see it or not. So we're intermittent, episodic with. Information that's often very scattered between paper records, electronic records, and don't talk to each other. And the result is we end up very reactive. We wait for the patient to show up with a heart attack, or diabetes, or a stroke, or I'm a cancer doctor. Most patients show up with stage three or stage four disease. And from the big picture, everything we've been talking about the last couple of days here, we can put together to make health and medicine much more continuous with our data. And be much more proactive, and to make you, as the individual, owning and more proactive on top of that system, c- together with your healthcare providers, and even to make more precision. Many of the amazing drugs we have only work for a small p- portion of the population. We need to get more precise, and as we move forward, move the needle not just to you know preventing disease, but optimizing our health and wellness. So, as Peter talked about yesterday, you know, 100 could be the the, the new 60, and that takes. Early action and new a new mindset, because none of us want to be 100 and not able to think or move or walk. We need to think about uh, quality of life, health span, not just lifespan. Now, a lot of this is being driven by new information, from genomic information to digital information. You can be the CEO of your own health in the near future, but we need to enable that to connect the dots between. 
insurance companies, hospitals, our individual information. We need to connect those dots because often the incentives are misaligned to share information. That's a big part of the, of, of the future. And the future itself is not just about fancy technology and 3D printed organs and, and you know, amazing surgi surgical and radiologic elements. It's about realigning the incentives. And the incentives in healthcare in many parts of the world are often a bit misaligned. Um, in the US and even in most of Asia, doctors and nurses and hospitals get paid to do more procedures, to bring more hospitals and patients into the hospital, not to keep you healthy. You're not rewarded to stay healthy. We don't pay for drugs and devices uh, if, they if they don't work. We pay for all of them. So part of the shift in health and medicine is to move to realigning the incentives, paying for devices, apps, platforms, drugs, uh, hospitalization, surgeries, only when they work. And that, together with technology, can really move the needle. Another major trend is where's healthcare happening? No longer do you need to go to the hospital, to the emergency room, to the intensive care unit. Healthcare is coming from the hospital to the home, to our phone, to inside and uh, on our bodies. And that is transforming where healthcare can happen from the, from the corner pharmacy. Oops, let me go back. You know, corner pharmacy can do more and more. Inside these pharmacies, we're seeing diagnostic platforms. I, I visited some of the pharmacies here. They're, they're pretty amazing. I, I learned that you already have invented the future of healthcare here in Southeast Asia. Uh, it cures everything, tiger bomb. So that's all we need to know. <laughs> Golden cup also, very good. <laughs> so future is already here. Um, now, part of this new future, of course, is the consumer, the transparency. We can now compare one hospital across the street to another. If you're a concierge practice uh, or a, 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 a medical tourism site, maybe uh, I'm in New York and I can compare the, the outcomes for the hip surgery from the hospital across the street or Yelp for doctors, vitals.com. Or you can go into individual surgeons and see their outcomes and their complication rates. So there's new levels of transparency. Just like when you rate a hospital, we're starting to rate doctors and uh, hospital systems. And of course, as you've been, we've been hitting you over the head with, these are riding exponential trends. I mean, the power of Moore's Law, the power of, you know, even my antique 10-year-old iPhone 2 is pretty incredible. And these have really become, of course, healthcare platforms in just the last decade. My iPhone 2 feels antique. My iPhone 10 in my other pocket will feel antique in 10 years. Um, so as we move into this future, realize, you know, 10 years, what could the future of Health 4.0 be like in Thailand and Southeast Asia? You know, 10 years ago, the iPhone came out, Twitter launched, Facebook launched, Airbnb was still selling mattresses. A lot can happen in a decade. And of course, again, these mobile supercomputers are part of this history. David showed you the advanced, advanced uh, iPhone. I, I've got the next version there uh, as well. Uh, it gets bigger and better. Um, but these are really becoming medicalized and enable us to democratize and dissolve many technologies. You don't buy a GPS unit or a video camera. It's embedded in your phone. And that same thing is happening and potential is to happen in health and medicine. So the desktop of 3000 fits on my Apple Watch. The Apple Watch is becoming a health diagnostic platform. We're now seeing computers the size of a grain of rice, which are all, of course, becoming connected. You, we've heard already about the Internet of Things. This is coming to the Internet of Healthcare, the Internet of Medical Things. And this won't be riding 4G. Uh, you're gonna soon, I was talking to some of the folks from True. You're soon going to have 5G here, which will be 100 times faster than our 4G network. So tremendous new rails to ride digital and connected health. So lots of room for investment and improvement there. Now, a lot of these new terms are often buzz ter buzzwords. Connected health, mobile health, digital health. I think we'll soon call it health. But it does give us the opportunity to connect information from genomics to our public health systems, uh, to using artificial intelligence to make sense of the data. We have, of course, no one exponential. It's this convergence of everything from mobile and apps to virtual reality to 3D printing to AI. I want you all to become thinking about this convergence of technology and how we put it together in new ways to address the challenges here in Southeast Asia and beyond. And we have challenges across the planet, right? Rising costs, aging populations in many parts of the world, access to healthcare. There's a good number of doctors here and, and nurses in Thailand, but many, maybe not enough in the rural areas, for example. We have lots of big data, but how do we make that actionable information and unfragmented? And how do we help our regulatory bodies, whether it's, whether it's the FDA or the insurance companies, reward for, reward and speed up the ability for software to be a medical device, for example? Uh, and how do we address the aging population, which is certainly uh, growing here uh, in, in Thailand and, and, and surrounding countries? 
So lots of challenges. It, that means an exponential and convergent t uh, mindset is important. And understanding what the challenges are. Here, the, the rate of type 2 diabetes is rising, and that's a lifestyle disease. And we have the ability to understand its prevalence. You know, Thailand isn't so bad, but neighbors in Vietnam and Bhutan, really high rates. And it means we need to pay attention early uh, to be proactive to prevent the diseases and costs from that going downstream. And again, that's a global issue. Uh, it's growing around the planet uh, in almost, a, a, almost an exponential rate. And it also means we need, I'm a pediatrician as well, pay attention to your children. If you give your six-month-old child white rice cereal, they're going to have a much higher risk of getting type 2 diabetes and have different epigenetics than if they start with whole grains. So sometimes starting very young can make a big difference. Okay. I'm going to talk a lot about technology, but just the last point on this is that it's often the social elements, access to clean water, vaccination, social connection, that are much more important than our fancy technologies uh, in the long run. So let's pay important to the very basic parts as well. Now, you've already heard a lot about reinvention, reimagination. Just a great talk on, on the world of Uber and beyond. I used my Grab app here when I arrived. Um, and companies as like Uber, Grab, are exponential companies. They didn't invent GPS, online maps, online uh, payments. They connected the dots, right? And as you've heard, these things are moving quickly. Self-driving Ubers are here. Um, there's even a, a fun platform out of Japan, Human Uber, developed in Japan, provides a way to attend events remotely using another person's body. It's surprisingly natural. So maybe next year's summit, you bring your, uh, send your Uber uh, passenger. And Everyone wants the Uberization of the, of the, or the grabification right now. You want to be able to press a button and get what you want. And that's even coming and being built by companies like Uber, where they have a platform where you press a button on the app and a nurse comes to give you your flu shot. Many folks don't get their vaccinations. So bringing folks to get care to them or bringing patients to the clinic is actually being built by companies like Uber and Lyft. That can connect the dots and improve outcomes. And now there's Ubers for bringing doctors to you or nurses. I'm not sure what kind of doctor you get, but you get a doctor. Uh, also to deliver your pharmacy drugs. Um, Amazon, as you've heard, is disrupting many fields, is now buying pharmacies and is getting into the pharmacy business in the United States. Very threatening to the pharmacy. Soon you'll get your drugs by drone. So other big players coming into the space, redesigning everything from insurance, you know, from health insurance uh, to insuring your, your, your property. Companies like Lemonade, started by one of our SU executive program graduates, looking at the future of insurance using AI and mobile. And of course, it's even coming to our world of biotech and pharma, Pharmageddon, the one-size-fits-all drug will not be the norm in the future. So you've heard a lot about this in the last few days. The takeaway is, of course, you want to Uber yourself before you get Kodak. That's all you need to remember for the last two days. One sentence, all right. So let's look at healthcare. Um, I've been very lucky to be involved from the beginning with Singularity University, and what's interesting is lots of people from many fields come to SU, and we've had about, we have many startups that have started there. At least half of them are focused on health and medicine in some way, and at least half of those were started by people outside of healthcare. So you don't need to be a doctor, biotechnologist, pharma person to start a healthcare company, but it takes, um, a bit of a convergent mindset. And because most healthcare conferences are very siloed in cancer, oncology, pharma, um, seven years ago, we started a program, Exponential Medicine at Singularity U, where we bring doctors, patients, technologists from all sorts of fields together. We've now grown. We meet every fall at the Hotel Del Coronado. Um, and it's pretty magical, just like in a room like this, when many people come together from different areas and you ask, what is the future of healthcare? From robots and drones to, to 3D printing and experiencing that and and sharing and cross-fertilizing lessons from, from, you know, even old lessons. This is from the head of innovation from National Health Service in London. Old quote, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. What are the old ideas you have in your old mindsets related to your health, related to your companies, that you need to forget or get out of the way before you move forward? Um, and so we've had many multidisciplinary groups from around the world come together at Exponential Medicine. We've even had the head, the head, the head of our FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, come to learn about how to catalyze new thinking and regulatory. So as you are thinking about change here in, in Thailand and beyond, you have to engage your government and regulatory bodies to get Exponential uh, as well. So hopefully some of you can come join us uh, at Exponential Medicine uh, this November. Okay. Let's dive into four areas, and you guys are exponential thinkers now. I'm going to talk very quickly. I'll give you a link to my slides at the end, but we're going to go fast. Okay. Health and prevention, really important, because the big diseases are mostly caused not by our, you know, our genetics, which are important, 
but by our behaviors, particularly over time. And that applies to many diseases, but you know, bad sleep, smoking, stress, too much alcohol, drive most of our, our costs and our conditions. So how do we get a handle on that? Um, you know, here in Thailand, you know, there's sometimes behavioral elements you can change from the availability of sodas uh, to, to less fried foods. Um, how do we think about all these things to dramatically lower risk and change behavior? We know behavior change is hard, right? I'm wearing like five versions of wearables right now. Who, who has one on right now? Who, who has a kind of a Fitbit or trackable? Who else has one and you've lost it or it's the charger, it's in your drawer? No, a few of you asked, right? Yeah, they're not perfect yet, but remember, we've only had Fitbits for about eight or nine years. And they're starting to be used in all sorts of interesting ways, in the hospital, out of the hospital. We can move from the sensors 1.0, the accelerometer on our wrist, to sensors 3.0, pills that have RFID sensors that can tell when you took your medication. We can measure almost every element of physiology and behavior in pretty amazing ways. And I'm going to show you some examples. And of course, a lot of the big companies from Samsung and Google and Apple are all moving into making some of these digital devices. Um, and these can give us insights into our steps, into our sleep. And they're shrinking exponentially to the point where we literally can have a digital tattoo track almost all the technology that used to require an intensive care unit. So what are some examples of what we can do today and why is it important? It's one thing if you just have the data yourself on your watch or your phone, quantified self. Some of us are data geeks. But what if it moves from quantified self to quantified health? What do I mean by that? I mean that the data from your devices, your digital exhaust, your genomics, can start to flow into your healthcare system and help you measure your health and optimize your prevention and wellness, pick up disease and diagnose early, and then manage a disease like high blood pressure or diabetes or cancer. And that's starting to happen, because we've can digitize the scale, digital version. The next versions of the scales will not just track your weight, they're going to scan you and give you all your body measurements, whether you uh, want them or not. But this can be you know, another form of, of, of measure. And, and, and this is now you know, low cost and, and launching this year. Uh, we can digitize, of course, these wearables, and some of them are becoming regulated and being paid for by insurance companies like Kaiser or the National Health Service. Um, diabetes now, your glucometer can talk to your smartwatch with an AI coach and help you manage diabetes in smarter ways. Blood pressure, which is so common here in Thailand and beyond, can be measured on your watch and squeezes your wrist. But we don't want to squeeze our wrists anymore. That's old technology. We're seeing radar developed now that can essentially pick up real-time uh, heart rate and blood pressure 24-7. So lots of new ways to collect data. The challenge is going to be to go well beyond the wearable. What's an example going beyond the wearable? You know, you can track your steps, you can track your sleep. We're going to insidables, contact lenses that are being built with Google and pharma companies to track blood sugar for type 1 and type 2 diabetics. We're seeing insidables underneath your skin that can have an RFID to unlock your computer, but also can track some of your vital signs, like your potassium or how well you're oxygenated. And these are already approved and on the market in Europe. So these will last there for months. Starts with the military, we'll come to managing chronic disease. Um, we have the idea of a trainable, right? So in our era of smartphones, our postures aren't very good. We have smartphone neck, and posture is often a number one or two cause of coming to doctor visits. Now you can take a little device, like this one called the Upright, you can buy this on Amazon, put it on your back, and it's like your digital mother. It's gonna remind you uh, when to stand up. So if I'm slouching, if I'm slouching, and, I, and it's gonna measure that, after about three seconds, it's gonna uh, buzz my back and remind me to stand up straight. And about a week of wearing this will retrain your physiology to have a better posture. So it's just a small example uh, of, of a bit of a nudge, a trainable. Some of us need more shocks, Pavlov, shockables. A lot of you listen to music. The new music devices and hearing aids will track your heart rate and your steps and give you coaching on your runs or for someone who might have dementia. Ringables, I'm wearing a ring, Peter had the same one. It's like a Fitbit on my finger. It, it tracks my sleep or my lack of sleep. Uh, right now, I'm jet lagged. But you can get incredible data, just from a ring. This is my data, my total sleep, uh, my REM sleep, my re sleep stages, how much time I'm in light, my resting heart rate data, and give me, hopefully, coaching to improve that. So sleep is so important across many diseases. Your mattress can sense your sleep, and if you need help, there's even robots being built to help uh, nudge you to sleep. Uh, not for everybody, but um, something really important to pay attention to. 
Breath is something else you can start to quantify. You might be going on a social meeting or a date. Maybe you want to check your breath before you go. But now we're learning that the molecules in your breath can predict certain diseases, right? Breath is a biomarker. Dogs can smell cancer. Now there are breathables that can pick up early lung cancer or other metabolic diseases. In fact, I met a, a Bangkok-based company just yesterday, IonSense, that is building a platform to do exactly this here in Thailand. So we'll have new ways to... to Practice, track disease early. Um, we can also track our sweat when we're running. Uh, we can have our socks that might measure the, our feet and if they have injuries, particularly important for diabetic patients. Um, a lot of bad pollution in many parts of Asia. You can track that in many forms, but there's now even wearables that will track and crowdsource the pollution and maybe give you cues. Do you need to wear a mask today? Do you give your kids an inhaler if they have asthma? So new ways of collecting information. So bottom line, these will start to embed into our environments. You're not even going to need to think about being measured. Um, and, but if you have a disease, like a tremor like Parkinson's, our wearables will pick that up. In fact, the next version of the Apple Watch has a Parkinson's app to pick up tremor and help you prescribe medications uh, in a better way. Food, we heard a lot of great work about the future of food. You can measure your food. Does it have peanuts? Does it have uh, how many calories? So you can measure input and you can measure output. Very important data there. Um, seriously, it can be very important. Um, and of course, we want to have wearables that are also protectable. Maybe your grandmother had a hip replacement, has a risk of fall. She can wear an airbag to protect her from a fall. So well beyond the normal wearable. Bottom line, we can extend these technologies across the healthcare spectrum to a young pregnant mother to track her health and the health of the baby. And when the baby is born, maybe their temperature, how much milk they're drinking, or measure the baby with a camera embedded with artificial intelligence so you can tell whether they're moving, how much they're breathing, their respiratory rate, analyze their cry, right? That's a lot of data. Do you want that data? Do you want your diaper to tell you certain things? That's actually not science fiction. Um, when is it going too far? Again, just having data isn't enough. We need to make sense of it. It needs to become integrated. We don't want to be wearing 10 different devices and have 10 health apps. We're starting to see them become integrated so that you can be empowered to own your information, to share it, to have a, a, an AI coach and a real coach make sense of that going forward. Now, a lot of these technologies today are still one size fits all. You know, there's a, a digital divide. You've got uh, a young population in many parts of, of Thailand and Southeast Asia. They have a different way of connecting to healthcare than, let's say, a baby boomer. And if you're a company, you need to think about how do you communicate health information? What is the user interface? How is it different for a millennial and a, a digital native versus someone older? So sometimes we need to think about applying these with the right language, culture, incentives, based on someone's age, personality type, and beyond. And because these are becoming embedded in our consumer devices, there's now a lot of power to align incentives. I met one of the insurance companies here. Now they're giving lower insurance premiums if you are lowering your blood sugar or going to the gym. Um, so lots of new ways to leverage behavior change and, and personalize those incentives. Some companies are giving away Apple Watches based on your data. Now, as we move into this future, one of the important areas to, track, uh, to tackle is mental health. Mental health is in an area that's not improved very much. In fact, in the US and many parts of Asia, suicide rates are up and depression in impacts millions of our friends and family. And we've heard you know, big publicity about suicide rates. What can we learn and how do we leverage these technologies across Asia and across ourselves, our friends and family? We can now use some of our digital exhaust to pick up who's getting depressed from Instagram, maybe changes in an Instagram filter, or how much someone is texting or moving can be detected by uh, uh, and, and be used as a way of, of, of identifying folks at risk. We can look at our voice. Voice is a biomarker for picking up signs of depression or neurologic disorders. The same company actually found out that our voice changes when we're getting heart disease. So we might even be using our smartphones or our Amazon Alexas to diagnose uh, heart disease or something like depression and bring us help. Um, and of course, not everyone has access to a psychologist or mental health. Big issues with access uh, across Asia and the world. Now you can at least talk to a chatbot on your smartphone that might help you through an issue of depression. Or some advanced platforms like this one watch you and talk to you. It's watching her eye gaze, her voice, her language, her smile, and responds appropriately. Turn the sound up. What advice would you have given yourself Just leave the sound up. Well, so basically, this is a, a, an AI psychologist that's already on the market. And then you can even blend drugs and virtual reality and beyond. So lots of potential in mental health. 
Bottom line, we can start to measure our digital exhaust anywhere. Wi-Fi, this was published by MIT last year, can pick up the vital signs of up to 10 people at the same time in the same room. So we're going to start to have our digital exhaust collected 24-7, whether we want to or not. Big privacy issues, but big, op big opportunities to use that. So let's, let's see how we might use that going forward. It's, so, it's a so what if you just collect the data, if you see the raw data, if it's not digestible and actionable and matches you and your personality, we need to integrate this in smart ways. We need to integrate that with our healthcare team, your pharmacist, your doctor, your nurse. Today, they're often overwhelmed with digital checkboxes. We need to think about the workflow of the clinician so that we're truly doing patient-centered care, not spending more of our time on the computer than face-to-face -face with our, our patient. We need to, we're starting to see this actually happen. You know, Apple's health kit now, I can integrate my scale, my blood pressure cuff, my glucometer if I have it, all integrated onto my smartphone. And now at Stanford, I can connect that to my medical doctor all seamlessly through my smartphone. So he can see my data, like my Fitbit data, but right now my doctor doesn't know what that means. Just because you can track steps or sleep doesn't mean we know what to do with this digital exhaust. So we're starting to see Platforms like Google Health Verily doing the baseline trial, 10,000 volunteers sharing all their data, their digital exhaust, their genomics. The National Institutes of Health in the United States just launched all of us, a million volunteers from across different ages and social and economics and races sharing their data. Could you do something similar like that in Thailand or across Asia? Because a lot of the data we have about drugs and beyond often comes from a European, Caucasian population. We can start to crowdsource that here and around the world. And we're starting to see the blending of our personal mobile records and our actual health records. So, and then we need to incentivize connecting those dots. Now, that's a lot of information. How are we going to help ourselves or our medical teams give us predictalytics, predictive analytics, so that we can integrate these scores of our vital signs, our steps, our social network strength. If you're socially isolated, that's as dangerous as a pack a day of smoking. Giving us a bit of a wellness score, or for those of you in the financial world, a FICO score for your health. FICO is actually building a healthcare score system. So starting to look at this and use this to understand where our, our friends, our family, our employees, or if you're insurer, where, where your members are so you can help guide them. And how do we guide that, right? We don't want to be looking at data 24-7. Hopefully, it will be more like our modern car, which has 300 or more sensors and gives us a personal check engine light that your light goes on individualized to you. So these technologies are coming commoditized. It will be sort of the AI on stars for the body that will have the real value. And just like we've heard a lot about Tesla, what lessons could we take from Teslas? Teslas are almost self-driving. When they learn there's a, a dangerous curve, they slow down, they update the map in the Tesla, and then they share it with the other Teslas when they update. So could we apply that hive mind of sharing healthcare information across the continent and the world? Now, part of this is a lot of data and information, but we know behavior change is really hard. You're supposed to exercise more, eat less, less fried foods. Behavior change is hard. We need help. Coaching. They're now digital coaches. One popular in India, for example, is Goki. There's one called Vita, giving you coaching for diabetes or just losing weight. You can download uh, platforms like Omada Health for pre-diabetics. Instead of waiting for someone to become an expensive diabetic, put them on this platform, put them in with a social network group. Folks lose weight together in a social context, and that can be very cost-effective. We're seeing apps like Lark, which can coach you through your diet, your exercise, and remind me that I'm jet lagged and to go to sleep early. We can see these coaches come into virtual platforms with a nurse or doctor that might look like our nurse and doctor and give us uh, better insights. Um, home robots are coming to assist the elderly uh, or even folks with normal elements. But you know, we don't need a fancy robot. We're already in the era of you know, virtual uh, avatars, which will become more and more emotionally attuned and personalized to you, right? They're not real, but they'll feel real, and they'll be real enough to help you change your behaviors. We're already seeing that. Amazon Alexa or, and Google Home, they're, they're basically becoming health coaches. How much insulin should I take? Alexa, help, I fall and I can't get up. Google Home, make me my doctor's appointment. These are already being used as major platforms, as voice as an interface for health and coaching. And these coaches may show up in your mirror in the morning. You'll see you and your health score, and you'll see you of today. But what if you looked in the mirror? You didn't see you of today. You saw you of tomorrow. You're you of tomorrow. You're exercising. You're doing your, your big workouts. What if you keep having you know, sweets and donuts for breakfast? You of tomorrow, right? Uh, and if you can see yourself now and a thousand sweets, donuts later, that could be powerful change, right? Or many, many folks in Asia still smoke. What if you could show your, your, your teenager who's smoking what, what they're going to look like 10 years later, the effects of smoking? That can be a powerful change. That's the power of augmented reality. Or if you spend too much time on Facebook, what will happen? You know, so these are all 
tools that we can use. So speaking of convergence, augmented reality is an amazing example of convergence. These are my antique four or five year old Google Glass. These were not yet a big hit in the consumer side of the equation, but they're a really useful tool for surgeons uh, to, to see data, for doctors to see information. We're seeing augmented reality being used to train children with autism to recognize faces and smiles. We're seeing augmented reality platforms being like mi Microsoft, being used by doctors and nurses or for medical education. So you can take a medical student anywhere in the world and they can learn anatomy in powerful ways. So we're gonna see really impactful ways for augmented reality to change your understanding. To uh, take a surgeon now and enable them to look at your back and maybe do a more precise, more safe, more accurate surgery by layering in your CT scan data and then guiding you through the actual spine surgery, for example. So this is being built out. This will be the future of surgery. Um, it's already being used in some early versions or, for example, in a neurosurgery lab, we'll be able to overlap your MRI data. Lots of powerful ways of blending this together. And part of that can be used for behavior change. I'm going to have my volunteer, Jeff, come on up here. We're going to do a little uh, uh, checkup on him right now. <clears throat> I have my magical new version iPad. Let's stand here in the light. Let's do a little check. Take your jacket off, please. All right, this is a full exam. All right, let's take a look. Uh, let's turn this around here. Let's see. Let's, oh, look. I've got a nice view of him already. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I know what you had for breakfast. I know what you did last night. Okay. And we can take a look at his heart. Jeff has a very good heart. We can see the four chambers of his heart. If you can all see that around the room. This is augmented reality. All right. Thanks, Jeff. You check out okay? I'll send you the bill. Um, <laughs> slides back. Um, and this is an example, again, of, of being able to engage folks. You know, kids can get involved early, understanding their anatomy. My three-year-old son, Leo, now knows where his heart and lungs are and why they're important. So he's engaged in his health information. Um, if you're a medical student, or you can start to study with augmented reality instead of just having a textbook. Um, I spent many years as a pilot and a flight surgeon in the Air Force. And we use augmented reality when we fly. We have the heads-up display, which gives us data about where the bad guy is, if he's shooting at us, or if there's bad weather or about to hit a mountain, it will talk to us. Cool. Ah. Tells us to pull up. What if we use augmented reality for behavior change? Same way, you see your breakfast in one way, you see your breakfast now in a new way, you get another little hint. Cool. Ah. Pull up, it says, pull up. So. Now, again, we've already been using augmented reality as a healthcare game. Pokemon Go got people out of the house. We're seeing, of course, the next generation iPhones and other smartphones going to be embedded with VR and AR. So watch that space. Now, of course, there's virtual reality. How many folks here have tried full-on virtual reality? Who's tried it? Not that many of you. Okay, well, there's the expensive versions, then there's the cardboard versions. You all should do that. It's nothing more fun than to take grandma and let her ride her first roller coaster because VR feels virtually real. So you can do some fun things. And now there's a $200 US, uh, Oculus Go. These are becoming democratized and cheap. And then you can do fun things like this with your grandmother. <laughs> Not very nice. And start to use this in an educational way to learn anatomy, for example. Um, or for therapy. We can take folks who have burn injuries and put them into a, a cold environment where they throw snowballs and they use less than half the amount of pain medications. We're seeing this being used in physical therapy to get people engaged on top of their physical therapy and tracking it very objectively to help them improve after a surgery, for example. We're seeing it be used in hospitals. You might be going into a surgery, you're scared, you can go to the beach before your surgery, and that can lower stress levels and improve outcomes for almost for free. Uh, we're seeing virtual reality being used. I used it on an airplane for meditation, mindfulness training. Uh, all these things are basically here. And again, education in general is going to be transformed, but particularly medical education, where if you can walk into your own heart, or if I'm a surgeon and I can walk into my patient's heart, um, very transformative ways to, to learn and rewire your brain uh, as we move forward. And this can democratize surgical education. In many parts of Asia, there's not access to uh, a surgeon at all, or uh, it's very difficult to access surgical education. We have a shortage in many parts of the developing world of surgical care. Uh, my friend Shafi Ahmed is a surgeon in London, pioneering virtual surgery. I was in London with him two years ago. He did the first live stream VR surgery. 5,000 people were watching in real time the surgery using Google Cardboard on their smartphones. He's also pioneered the way to do uh, Snapchat uh, exams. So they're watching folks uh, in real time. He can basically record his exams. I have my Snapchat goggles here. I can now. Uh, video you all, right? This is, you know, consumer technology, but being used for, for medical education. And now they're even doing, you know, avatars, social VR, where you can bring in uh, other surgeons to help you and coach you in an operating room. So new ways of blending virtual augmented reality to, to coach and improve medical education. 
And of course, what you want to go with this is the full-on VR simulation. If you have a, a fractured leg and you have a, a strange fracture, you want your orthopedic surgeon to practice beforehand. So they go into the virtual operating room, they have the virtual actual instruments, they see your virtual leg, and they practice the procedure, maybe multiple times uh, on you. And it could be an orthopedic issue, it could be a cancer surgery, it could be a neurosurgery. This will be transforming how we do medical education and beyond. So instead of see one, do one, teach one, see one, sim one, sim one, simulate until you get it right. So I've already thrown a lot of technology at you. A lot of this already exists. I'm always asked, which one do I get? What blood pressure cuff works? So this summer, I'm launching a new web platform, digital.health, that's the website. So if you're looking for tools and technologies for you or your uh, systems, come join digital.health and we'll, uh, we'll hopefully democratize this around the planet. Now, what about genomics? We heard a bit about genomics yesterday. The price of sequencing coming down at twice the rate of Moore's law to about 100 US dollars, soon maybe 10 US dollars. What do you do with that genetic information? How does your doctor make sense of it? How do we use it to understand the genes of longevity so we can let, understand who's likely to live longer or use the information from that to improve longevity? How do we take those genes, for example, and make them useful? Even with 23andMe, that's not a full genome. I can take my own genetic information. This is 200 US dollars. I can look at my risk of certain diseases like chronic kidney disease or diabetes, or how I respond to certain drugs, pharmacogenomics. Many of you don't realize it, but you understand pharmacogenomics because particularly many Asians have what's called Asian flush. Drink a, a glass of alcohol, turn red. That is your genes metabolizing alcohol slowly. That can apply to many other drugs from a statin to a blood pressure medication. We can use that in the clinic today. There are now app stores for your genome that have launched. You can do some interesting things with an app store for your genome. You can look at your genes related to athletic ability. This is my data. I'm a pretty fast runner. My meta metabolic efficiency is high at 77. I'm lousy at long distance running. My endurance genes are low. I wanted to get up this morning and run around Bangkok. Couldn't get out of bed. I can blame my parents. As you see on the left, my motivation genes are low. Thanks, mom and dad. But that's complex genetic information. Or if some of you are wine drinkers, you can look at your taste buds and your smell genes and maybe pick the appropriate wine. Or do fun things like this. These socks are actually printed out specifically based on my exact genomics. Very unique socks. But that's for fun. When this gets interesting, back to a disease like type 2 diabetes. We can now sequence thousands of type 2 diabetics and using machine learning understand how they respond to drugs, devices, and other, uh, uh, other interventions. So we're going to subset diseases at the genetic level. Beyond the genome, there's the microbiome, the, bu the bugs, especially bacteria that live in our GI system and our gut, where learning play a really important role. The bugs in your gut play a role in your risk for cardiovascular disease, for obesity, maybe even for Parkinson's and other neurologic disorders, where you can get your own microbiome done for about 50 US dollars. And this gets really interesting when we can start to do microbiome transplants called fecal transplants. Not very appetizing, but you can reboot the bugs in your gut to cure disease or maybe lower your chances of obesity or other issues. And now we're starting to put this together so that instead of giving, selling someone to just take, do a diet, we can look at their microbiome, their genome, and other data to prescribe them a very specific diet. In, the, in San Francisco, there's a company called Habit that will do all those tests and deliver food to your drawer the food to your door specifically based on your genomics and other information. So this convergence uh, is really getting interesting. Now, of course, there's old technologies, free technologies. Many of them have been practiced here in Thailand for many years. I try and meditate. Uh, meditation can be very powerful. And now there are ways to look at the impact of mindfulness training using new technologies like consumer brain-computer interfaces. This one you can also buy online and use it to optimize your mindfulness training or use it to train a child who has attention deficit disorder to better focus using a game instead of drugs. Or now we're seeing video games being based on these technologies so that you play the game and you can improve your cognition or your ability to multitask. And these are now going through clinical trials and we'll start seeing prescribed FDA approved video games in the near future. On the far end of brain-computer interface, this is from my alma mater, Brown University, we can take someone who's quadriplegic, and now she can move a robotic limb just by thinking, right? So we're going to enable the disabled and start to even super-enable those of us who have normal brains and spinal cords. Even Elon Musk is getting into uh, the brain-computer interface space as well. So watch that on the exponential. We may all be connected to our computers in new ways in the next decade. All right, what about diagnostics? We want to pick up disease early anywhere. Diseases like Alzheimer's with the aging population, you can pick up who's going to get Alzheimer's in many cases by a PET scan or by blood-based genetics or a simple eye tracking game. So what if you could determine who's likely to get dementia, Alzheimer's, 10 years later? Maybe there are some drugs in clinical trials that we can start to use 
proactively at stage zero instead of stage four. And there's lots of new ways to look at your brain. I had my brain scanned at Human Longevity Incorporated. And I, the AI already labeled my brain and compared me to others. And that can be a proactive way of understanding and how to optimize and prevent disease uh, later. So lots of new ways of doing diagnostic. The most ex exciting ways is to bring that to you, right? The fact that we can do an entire laboratory on a chip and use your supercomputer on your smartphone to do the analysis. Where might that be particularly important? Well, here, I went to the pharmacy here in Thailand. I could buy almost any biotic I wanted just by walking to the counter. And we know there's a problem with overprescription and uh, antibiotic resistance is an issue. There are new, this is a new company out of Israel that can do a five minute test with saliva or blood to determine when you have a cough or some, is it a virus or is it a bacteria? So we prescribe less antibiotics. So we might walk into the pharmacy here at a 7-Eleven in five years and, and get that test done and not be given the antibiotics unnecessarily. We have a whole new set of digital doctor's tools, whole sets of things. This is an a, a, a Indian-based company, Clinivantage. This will track all sorts of elements and even have a connected blood pressure cuff and do a digital exam. Um, you can take the old-fashioned halter and make it into a simple patch. We're seeing ways now to swallow a pill and it can do a, a digital exam. You know, it's a lot of exponential technology in that little pill that can be used to both to diagnose and do minimally invasive therapy. An ultrasound device can connect your smartphone with artificial intelligence and give a nurse in a rural village the same skill and knowledge as a cardiologist or obstetrician here in the main city. So lots of new ways to democratize diagnostics, even to our wristwatches, the Apple Watch. Here's an example from earlier this year. This patient tweeted this out. Never thought a stupid little wrist computer I bought two years ago would save my life. Saw my heart rate go up, ended up being a pulmonary embolism, a clot in his lungs. His heart rate told him that he had something going on. He went to the emergency room. Maybe in the future, it'll call the Uber ambulance for you to take you there. You can do digital ear exams instead of bringing your child in. The virtual ear exam. Is the pediatrician going to get paid for doing that? Are there incentives aligned for using these technologies? Lots of challenges, lots of opportunities to diagnose everything from a cough uh, to very complex disorders. Now, Cardiovascular disease, a big killer here in Thailand and beyond. Now you can pick up your, your EKG on your smartphone. You simply put this little attachment on the back of your cell phone case, and you can do your EKG, and it, the AI anal analyzes it. This company now also launched a version, again, these you can buy on Amazon, on your watch. So if you have atrial fibrillation, a funny heart rate, you can measure that on your watch. They're doing over a million EKGs every month, and it's becoming a big data play as well. Uh, there's even now, you know, uh, uh, band-aids you can wear, I have somewhere in my pocket, that basically you wear the patch and it's an intensive care unit tracking my 24-7 heart rate and other data. That's a lot of information. So let's say we're proactive. You pick up someone early who might have heart disease. Now instead of getting the old-fashioned angiogram, you can do a virtual angiogram, a 30-second CT scan. Now the supercomputer does the computation. How narrow are your blood vessels in your heart? Um, do you need, let's say, a full-on bypass surgery? Or maybe you need a stent. And maybe we'll even 3D print the stent to match your own anatomy. So the idea of a virtualized AI-enhanced exam is already here. Now, you heard about tri uh, Star Trek. Uh, I worked with Peter and the XPRIZE to design a new Star Trek-inspired medical tricorder XPRIZE. We had uh, over 300 teams enter this competition to make a diagnostic device that you could have in your pocket to do what you used to require a doctor to do. One of the companies built this one. This is the Scanner Do Scout. It'll pull down my temperature, my oxygen saturation, my blood pressure, talk to IBM Watson on my smartphone. They also developed smart ways to screen for influenza, for example, or your analysis. You don't need to bring the lab to the, the urine to the lab. You can dip it, and your smartphone can take a picture and analyze your urinalysis. So new ways of, again, democratizing at low cost diagnostics. We're now um, building out a new X Prize for cancer. Cancer is a big issue in Asia. Many folks get diagnosed very late. What if we could connect the dots and make a prize where we could pick up disease early rather than late? So we're launching uh, later this year, early next, a cancer X Prize for the ability for rapid, accurate, and affordable cancer screening. Uh, and our vision for that is to make it uh, under $24, under 24 hours from Tennessee to Tanzania, as cheap and as easy as a urine dipstick. And we'd love many of you individually or your companies to get engaged with that. Just go to xprize.org, cast cancer. And we'd love to make tests that are maybe particularly relevant here for liver cancer or stomach cancer that are prevalent in, in Southeast Asia. All right. I've thrown a lot at you. How do we put it all together, right? Um, the average doctor can never keep up with all the literature. Um, the average patient sometimes knows more than their doctor. So we're needing to pull the information together. You've already, you'll hear more next about artificial intelligence, about connecting the dots. You've heard about IBM Watson, AI. I like to think of it as IA, intelligence, 
augmentation. We're going to need IA to do smart things. For example, do you need to go to a dermatologist? No, you can take a picture now of your skin, and the app can tell you, is that a cancer, a melanoma, or a mole? You can download these apps today. This is not the future. Um, you can look at the back of the eyeball now. This is work by Google, and they can pick up the progression of diabetic retinopathy. And as they published two months ago, the ability just to do an eye scan can predict who's going to have a heart attack or stroke in the next two months. So it can be pretty scary technology, but this can democratize early screening. It can be done you know, every, every part of the world for very low cost. So AI-based diagnostics and screening, or digital pathology, or digital radiology. The radiologists are at Stanford are already being beaten by these AI platforms, and it's still very early days. Uh, it may even predict who's going to live or die when you enter a hospital. So AI is powerful. It's not going to replace the doctor or the nurse or the radiologist. We need to blend together the human skills, compassion, decision. The human element is so important and with the machine learning uh, to move forward in that space. Okay, really quickly. Therapy. We want new ways of doing therapy. You already heard about CRISPR. Gene editing is coming to the clinic to maybe cure diseases like sickle cell and thalassemia, for example, which are based on one gene. These are already in clinical trials. We're already seeing maybe CRISPR used to cure HIV, uh, to treat cancer, uh, you know, lots of forms of particularly li liver cancer uh, in many parts of, of, of Thailand and, and beyond. We're seeing immunotherapy become very, very powerful. Instead of taking a toxic chemotherapy, we're turning on your ability for T cells to act on specifically on your tumor. Uh, we're seeing non-surgical surgery. Instead of having a big open surgery, you go inside an ultrasound machine and apply focused ultrasound to knock out a uterine fibroid or metastases in your liver or your lung. So really interesting new ways of blending technologies for non-invasive therapy. And new ways of delivering drugs to track them, new ways to prescribe therapy, not just a pacemaker for the heart, but a pacemaker for the brain or for the gut or for sleep apnea or a pacemaker for or underneath the skin remote control contraception. Honey, where's the remote? <laughs> or what if someone hacks your remote or hacks your pacemaker or hacks your medical record or hacks your hospital? We need to apply technologies like we heard about yesterday, blockchain, to better keep our healthcare data safe and secure. And then finally, this is all going to shift the medical practice, right? You can prescribe an app for disease. You can prescribe a virtual visit. You can do a digital checkup from almost anywhere. These might be in your corner 7-Eleven where you go into a, into a health pod and it does a lot of screening and scanning and then you get the drug or therapeutic right there. Or some of these uh, will come to your home, a home-based diagnostic platform like this one or your school that can be used almost anywhere with machine learning, with AI to do the basics. But then when you need to talk to a real doctor, you can do telemedicine based there. So, Smartly integrating technologies as we come up together. Chatbots are here, virtual visits. Good Doctor in China already has 190 million users after three years. Lots of new digital platforms coming to connect the dots. And the way we do these visits will become more and more virtual. You won't have to go wait in line to see the clinician. You'll feel like you're there in the same room. All right, uh, robotics, uh, 3D printing. Uh, you just heard a great talk about 3D printing. Very briefly, I'll show you some examples in healthcare. You have a fracture. No, you can print out the cast. Um, let's say you uh, need a new hip or implant. It might be printed in the operating room. What does that happen to the future of the medical device company? One of our SU companies you heard about made in space, built the first 3D printer in space and printed the first medical objects, including the first splint for an astronaut who might have broken their finger. So remote ways of printing uh, therapies. And then you might even think about printing organs. That's kind of far into the future in terms of actually something we can use therapeutically, but we're seeing the ability now to use gene editing to modify the pigs of, let's say, uh, modify the hearts and the bodies of pigs. So you may need an organ transplant, and it might not be kosher, but you'll take it from a pig because uh, they're really moving quickly into the clinic to humanizing pigs uh, with human-based genes to give you the opportunity of an organ transplant. All right, my last one minute, my time is up. How do we globalize this? We want to bring healthcare around the world and optimize it for everyone. Internet of medical things can pick up pandemics and diseases early, you know, the, the markers of, a, of a Ebola or H1N1, and that can be used in powerful ways. We can, uh, again, as you heard, democratize medical education with Google Loon and opening up internet access from rural Africa to rural Thailand. We can start to uh, provide drugs and devices to remote regions in rainy season or after disaster. And uh, this is being done now in Africa. A thousand clinics are being linked together by a drone that can, for example, deliver a vaccine or a blood product in within 10 minutes. So many powerful ways a lot riding exponentials. Drone defibrillators, and with the traffic here, you're gonna need drone ambulances uh, pretty soon. All right. My last point is discovery. We all can be partners in this healthcare future. We can 
all join clinical trials. You can download a clinical trial, be part of that trial, measure your data, crowdsource it. And just like you know, 10, 11 years ago, we still drove with paper maps. Now, what if we had a future of healthcare that was crowdsourced maps of health? Just like we can build a map of Rome in a day based on driver data, we could build a healthcare map for Thailand, Southeast Asia, and beyond, just, and, and gives us a better way to get to where we want to go in bad traffic uh, or beyond. So that's sort of the takeaway. We can all not just be organ or blood donors, we can all be data donors so, and share our information. So to sum it all together, a lot of the themes you heard here at the summit can be leveraged together and converge to impact the future of health and medicine. It's no one technology, it's how we put them together. And I hope with all of your help and your insight and new imagination, we can move and be like Wayne Gretzky. Don't think in 2018, skate to where the puck will be with health and medicine. And if we do that together, we can all really move to the future of healthcare. From sick care to healthcare, from one size fits all to personalized. We can move from this reactive siloed sick care model to an era of true continuous proactive and participatory healthcare. It's up to all of us to get out of our linear mindsets, not to predict the future of health and medicine, but build it together. So with that, thank you for your time. And if you want a copy of my slides, text your email to the number. Thank you very much.